I am here with Ahan Menon of Prometheus Macro. Uh, Ahan is a macro analyst who looks at many different things, the business cycle, liquidity, inflation, growth, a very da- data-driven approach. And uh, I'm very glad to have him. Ahan, welcome to Forward Guidance. Hey, Jack. It's great to be on. Uh, I've been a listener for a minute, so uh, glad to contribute. Me too. What are you thinking right now? It's We're recording on August 30th. This will come out in early September. Uh, you know, so many people thought a recession was going to, we would be deep in a recession by now. We're not. So many people, the stock market would uh, continue to go down. It hasn't. You know, in the past nine months, past close to a year. Wow. Uh, you know, been in a, close to a bull market. <laughs> What's going on and what are, what are you thinking right now? When you think about how a tightening cycle typically progresses, right, you usually have nominal activity running really hot. Inflation is high and policymakers kind of come in and try to cool down demand and curtail inflation by raising interest rates, right? Um, And the the channel they usually have to do that, right, is to raise interest interest rates, which impacts debt service costs, right, for the private sector. And I think there are quite a few things that are unique in this cycle. But what has been particularly unique is that what actually impacts the the private sector is something called net interest expense, right? And that net interest expense is just your gross interest expense, which is how much you're paying on your debt, minus the income you're receiving on your, your, the interest income you're receiving on your assets. And what we've had over, say, the 2000s, and particularly during COVID, is you've basically had a lot of cash and treasury assets right, short duration treasury assets pushed into the private sector relative to a private sector deleveraging on the liability side. And so when you look at that picture, that net interest expense to the private sector hasn't actually risen that much. And so nominal activity hasn't been curtailed. And that's really what's caused you to one of the major drivers of why you've had a slower part to recession. And so now when we think about how that's going to evolve, we think that the tightening will flow through, but it's going to be dampened by these effects. Um, and you do need to pull another couple of levers to get sufficient tightening to elicit a recession. And so when we when we look out at the picture of taking into account this and a few other things, we think that if policymakers actually stay the course, and that's that's critical. They have to stay the course, both in terms of liquid, liquidity tightening and maintaining existing tightening, that it becomes reasonable to start thinking about a durable downturn in real GDP starting in around March of 24. Okay, so uh, net interest expense n- not going up by that much for the private sector. Here's what I think when you say that. Tons of low-yielding assets were created when interest rates were at zero. Mortgages at 2 or 3 or 4%. A lot of those were owned by commercial banks, but particularly the Federal Reserve. Uh, So now people are paying those very low interest rates that they got locked in, and they're receiving the short-term interest rates uh, in treasuries or the private sector is receiving those those assets. So I actually kind of relate that to an inverted yield curve. So that is, uh, uh, if if, if customers are uh, paying the long end and receiving the short end, they're actually doing pretty well in an inverted yield curve. Explained, and I, I understand how that makes sense, but explain to how that is sustainable because typically in an inverted yield curve, you think of uh, a contraction of credit because banks aren't going to make enough of that of that spread. So do you think, how sustainable do you think that is? Right, and I don't think it's, it's so it's not, you know, an inverted yield curve essentially on some level invalid, like it violates the time value of money, right? And so inverted yield curves are typically not very sustainable dynamics. And so I don't think that it is a sustainable dynamic. But what you have to think about is that the borrowing that you have at really low interest rates is termed out, essentially. And so the it's going to take time and a gradual amount of refinancing, right, to slow, to increase interest rates, interest burdens very significantly. At the same time, you have this very high kind of nominal cash pool in the economy that's earning the short rate. And where are those? And I, I asked this because I know you got a good answer for it. Uh, where are those cash pools? Reverse repo, bank accounts? Yeah, tell us about that. Right. So the there are a few of them, right? So you do have a good amount in bank deposits, but you've actually seen a pretty large migration from bank deposits to money market funds. And that's come 
partly from institutions, right? So, you know, you can think of corporates managing those cash pools, and you can also think about households trying to say, hey, like, we're not getting that much at our bank deposit. Why, why don't we money, migrate to a money market fund? And so those, those money market funds, right, by our estimate, the, the actual income benefit that you're getting is something close to 2% of GDP, which is, which is a huge ballast if you think about it to nominal spending. And so wh- when you actually think about what needs to happen, right, is you need to slow incremental financing. So we talked about how, okay, net interest expense isn't rising that much. So what do you need to do? You need to slow nominal spending relative to that net interest expense. And that the difference between those two things, when that turns negative, that's when you have a contraction in activity. So there are two different ways to do it. Either you can push up interest expense a lot, or you can try to curtail new spending, right, which is nominal income. And that's what I think the Fed has to do by leaning both on liquidity and keeping policy rates tight. Because a large part of spending that's in the economy comes from levered spending. Comes from what, what spending? Levered spending, right? So res- residential, non-residential, equipment spending, things like that. And those items, right, are sensitive to new financing. And so the, the higher interest rate you kind of have, the less incremental you're spending you're going to get in those areas, and you're going to have a deceleration in nominal income. And so we've seen some of that already. We just need a lot more. At the same time, right, because of these kind of net interest dynamics that we're discussing, and probably three other factors that we can discuss. Um, You've had a way more resilient economy and resilient consumer, right? And I think that this is particularly important in this cycle, that the Fed has to actually lean on financial conditions to be able to cause a rise in savings rates and bring down consumer spending. And the combination of those things is the package that gets you to a recession. But without that package, so the less items you have on that package, the slower the process. And is the current level of interest rates of 5.5% and quantitative tightening, the level of quantitative tightening the Fed's doing, is that sufficient to for that package? I think over time, yes. So I think if you take the package of quantitative tightening as it is with treasury issuance today, right? And we can talk about the dynamics of treasury issuance and whatnot. But I think that if you take the combination of quantitative tightening, long duration supply, and existing interest rate tightening, and you keep you hold those conditions for six six months, that is enough. But it, you need to be able to sustain those conditions. Okay, how does the Treasury issuance, the U.S. government funding itself by issuing debt, how does that change, and why might that change uh, now? Right, so. I think um, about three weeks ago, you had a pretty big sea change in what is broadly the liquidity ecosystem, okay? And so I think before we get into it, I'd like to take a step back and kind of just talk about how we think about liquidity because I think it's it's a telling conversation, right? So I think that when you think about liquidity, we try to have a comprehensive definition of what liquidity is. So for us, liquidity is the flow of cash and cash-like assets that potentiate spending in the real and financial economy. And so the more cash and cash-like assets you have in the system, the less risk you essentially have, right? But there's also more potential to take on risk. So you can imagine there's a lot of money market fund money, or there's a lot of cash injected by the treasury through fiscal, and you just have potential to take on more risk. And so when you're really trying to measure liquidity, what you're trying to do is you're trying to measure aggregate economy balance sheet risk, right? And so there are really two parts to the equation. There's how much risk that already is in the system, and there's how much risk that's coming online, right? And so whenever an entity of any kind, like a corporation, a household, the treasury, they issue a security, they're actually pushing risk into the system to varying degrees depending on the type of issuance. So what has happened recently? Relative to recent history, the treasury is issuing a lot of bonds. So about 380 billion over the next two quarters. I might be wrong on the precise number, but it's a lot relative re- to recent history. When you say bonds, you mean treasuries in general or like coupon notes, bonds? Coupon. So so no, bonds meaning like notes and bonds. So so coupons. Yeah. So so a treasury bill is something that doesn't have a coupon. So you you know you buy it at ninety nine dollars and you redeem it at a hundred. That's your yield. Whereas a coupon is something that you get paid 
every quarter or every you know two quarters, and that's what you know, an, an interest payment. So the bills are you're saying are cash treasury bills that the U.S. Treasury issues as it has done recently. Uh, is funding itself with very cash-like assets. It doesn't require a lot of balance sheet capacity to uh, have, take a treasury bill onto your assets. It's basically having a bank deposit, um, but it, it's you know it's with uh, the U.S. government instead of you know, and it's a security, whatever. Whereas a thirty-year treasury bond or an agency mortgage-backed security or a non-agency mortgage-backed security or let alone like a corporate bond, those have some credit risk, duration risk, and those require a lot more balance sheet capacity. So, right, exactly, nailed it. So what is happening now is that relative to recent history, the, the treasury is increasing its duration of issuance. So, and we think that that duration is going to be poorly received, right? And we can get into the reason of reasons as to why it's going to be poorly received. And if that duration is poorly received, the only way those bonds are going to clear, and they have to, is through higher yields. And the sources of funds that are going to be used to finance that duration is likely to be the selling of other assets. The combination of those things is an injection of risk, right? Which is also an injection of volatility, which as a package decreases system-wide liquidity. And that's the liquidity impact that's coming online. So liquidity conditions have been way better over the next, over the last 12 months or so. But we're kind of at an inflection point in that. And would you say that the Treasury's decision to issue cash-like securities, Treasury bills, recently after the debt ceiling, that, would you say, played some role in the, you know, bull, uh, the, the appreciation of the stock market? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you if you think about, so, and now this goes into the the nitty gritty of how how it's funded, right? So how how is how is the how are the treasury bills funded? The treasury bills are largely funded by this release valve that's in the form of the reverse repo, and so that that issuance of bills was really easily absorbed by the private sector because you have a lot you have lots of nominal activity, fiscal stimulus, all these things pushing money into money market funds. Those money market funds don't really have a place to park it, so they go to the reverse repo, and then. When bills are issued, bills look attractive. And so it's very easily absorbed. Now, the thing is, what is changing is that as you have more and more treasury bond supply, first off, the the, the assets in the, in the reverse repo aren't really looking for treasury bonds. They are not looking to take on duration risk, right? And in some cases, they, they can't. So yeah, money, money market funds, so they own short-term assets. There was a, a, a lack, a shortage of assets of short to cash like assets in 2021. So it went into the re- reverse repo facility effectively, not actually, but effectively a deposit facility with the Federal Reserve. So uh, even though they're lending, you know, the Federal Reserve collateral as if the Fed needs collateral, but, uh, and so, but that money is coming out of the reverse repo facility to buy the bills, but it can't come out of the facility to buy bonds because they can only invest in cash like securities. Exactly. It's, it's, it's not up to you. You know, even, even if you think duration is attractive, you can't buy duration. And so what we think is that if you if you actually look at so you know the reverse repo is out as a potential funding source for this duration right and then when we look at two directly and indi- indirectly levered players that could possibly so that there are three options in terms of what you can do to buy treasury bonds you can sell assets that you own right you can move from cash which is also selling assets but that's a that's a technicality um and you can also lever up right so the there are two entities that directly and indirectly lever up, right? There's the the hedge fund community, right? Um, but the problem with levering the position is that you have really poor carry, carry characteristics, bad trend, and you already have discount rate cuts priced into the curve. Because there's interest rates are, are high now. There's an inverted yield curve. You'd be borrowing at five point five percent to buy an asset that yields four percent. So you're exactly. losing money every day, which is not a good thing. So unless they cut 200, 300, 400 basis points, you're not going to make much money on that trade. Um, not going to make any money on that trade. And so the levered hedge fund community is going to have a lot of trepidation getting involved, right? At the same time, you can have commercial banks come in as buyers, and they will to a certain extent. But you have to remember that they are essentially synthetically long the same position because they have to play short-term deposits, right? <clears throat> And so when we when we think about those two players, it's unlikely that those two guys are going to underwrite risk. And then you can have the last player, which is going to be asset managers, households, and things like that. 
But the only other only option they really have, right, is to sell other assets. And so that's what we think is going to be the pressure on the liquidity ecosystem. And so when you think about it, that means yield higher. And that also means asset prices of a similar duration lower. The combination of those things is an impact on net worths, right? And if you have enough of an impact on net worths, you can possibly coax higher, higher savings rates. And so that's the channel that we're talking about when it comes to the Fed has to the Fed and Treasury have to lean on these two policy levers for a sustained period of time. They've done the tightening, they're doing the QT, but they also have to lean on this channel of hurting financial conditions to hurt net worth, which will bring up savings rates. And yeah, and bringing up saving rates reduces the consumption rate, which slows the economy, slows demand, slows spending. Tell us about this treasury issuance. Has it begun? Are the coupons going onto the market now? Uh, or if not, when? How have, they, how have they been received? A certain amount of it has begun, but mostly like it's going to be spread over, let's say, the next quarter, right? And so I think most of what you've seen so far isn't actually even the mechanical impact of it. A lot of it is just front running of the supply. And so I think there are two levels to how this impacts markets. The first is that, hey, there's a lot of duration coming online. Duration has gotten killed this year. Run for the exits, right? There's, a, there's that part of the component. And so if you look at market pricing, what we actually had immediately following the issuance was just people stampeding out of positions. Um, now, I think what's important to realize also is that there's just going to be a mechanical impact of the size of this issuance. So, you know, there's there's still, you know, a good 350 plus billion that needs to come online. And so that is, no matter, no matter how much front running you have, it's very hard to actually avoid the mechanical impact of that size of issuance. And when you run a back test of treasury coupon issuance, 10-year note, 20-year bond, 30-year bond, relative to asset price performance or liquidity conditions, what r results do you get? Because there are many instances where the treasury issues a ton of debt, and actually those are some of the best performing periods, right? Like I'm going to take uh, you know, late Mar March 23rd, 2020, the bottom of the stock market, uh, to March 23rd, 2021, huge amounts of treasury issuance and huge stock performance, right? So it's, it's the back test is a little difficult, I imagine. Right. And, and, and so this is what we specialize in. So this is a great, this is a great question, right? Um, if you actually look at the combination of things, okay? So what are the combination of things? You look at a hiking cycle, you look at um, a inverted yield curve, which is steepening, and you look at massive issuance, you can probably find about, since I would say 1965, about three months of back history. <laughs> um, and, and so you're not going to get much out of that process, right? I think what you have to recognize, right, is that you need to have a really good mechanical understanding of how this stuff plays out and that any one dimension of these things, right, is going to be misleading. Because if you, as you mentioned, usually when you have very large issuance, it's when interest rates are being cut in response to a financial crisis of some kind. And or the Fed is doing quantitative easing. Exactly, exactly. And so, and which is also in response to bad conditions, right? And so when you put that picture together using only one dimension of it, you're going to get a very misleading picture, right? It's like saying, oh yeah, every time the, the yield curve is inverted, you buy bonds. It's not always a good thing. And so you need to have a more comprehensive set of measures. And I think also understanding that these dynamics are pretty rare. And so you need to have a good mechanical understanding of the pluses and minuses that come from each of these components. And so you say three months of back tests for this period, going back to 1965, and remind us what exactly the conditions are. Uh, do you remember what what the time was? So how, how do you, as someone you know who pays a lot of attention to looking at history to learn from history so you can you know try and get a sense of what's coming in the future, when you have so little to run on, I mean, it, how do you make a... How, how do you formulate a, a view when there's so little uh, precedent? It's about taking into account what are the different levels, right? So you're trying to, you, what, what you essentially have when you have issuance is you have rising nominal GDP, right? Because that issuance directly actually feeds into nominal GDP and you can actually see that in deficits or the fiscal impulse. And there are many different ways to calculate that, right? On the flip side, um, you also have this liquidity impact that's coming from issuance, right? And what you have to 
be able to wrestle with is that those are effectively two opposing forces. Because a flow into nominal GDP is a benefit to asset prices, especially if that flow into nominal GDP is not well priced, right? At the same time, you also have this decline in liquidity conditions. And so one of the things that we were um, really vocal about, you know, over the last month or so was that until you have a very serious deterioration in economic conditions, stocks can outperform bonds for this very reason, right? Because issuance, while it's bad for all assets because of the liquidity impact, it also flows into the economy and it's flowing into the economy primarily through interest expense right now. And that is a benefit for stocks versus bonds. The, the outperformance of stocks versus bonds this year has been something for the record books. So you think it will continue at least for the short term? This is something very tactical, right? And to stay very close to the exits on. So um, our slow moving strategies have actually moved to actually short both stock, stocks and bonds because we think that growth expectations have you know, approached a local top. And we can get into the discussion on that. But I think that what you also have to kind of balance with that view is the fact that until activity turns and markets decide that activity has turned, stocks and bond, bonds can both go down at the same time, but stocks will outperform bonds. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're short both assets now. Yeah. But you think you think bonds are probably a, a little better short than stocks, maybe? Probably. Yeah. So we, when we when we net out all the things, right, I think there are there are there are probably three things to consider, right? There's the inflation outlook, there's what's priced into the curve, and there's the treasury issuance. So we already discussed the treasury issuance, which we think is going to be a weight on assets. It's going to be a curve steepener, right? Then there's where we think inflation is going to be, right? And we think that inflation, PCE, core PCE inflation, by around mid-year next year is going to be somewhere between 3.4 and 3.6%, right? And that number is going to be grossly inconsistent with the cuts that are priced into short-term interest rate markets. So you have cuts starting around mid-year next year, or maybe a little bit earlier, and that doesn't make sense. And sorry, why doesn't that make sense? Because you need to be below 2%. <laughs> you need to be at or below 2%. And so there is very unlike, so you have about five cuts priced into the, to, to the Fed Funds Futures Curve right now. And that is only consistent with recession and inflation below 2%. And so if our projections are right, and our projections are definitely not far out there. We have about, I think our median, uh, our median es estimate per month is about 30 basis points of core inflation, which is really not that far from where we are right now. So that's somewhere like three and a half percent. Um, that's some, yeah, that's 3.6%, right? Something like that. Um, so that's where we think, that's where we think we're going to get on a month-on-month -month basis. And, you know, over the last few months, we've actually, you know, over the last six months, we've actually had a higher rate of core inflation. And so um, when we look at that, the, that, those estimates, even if we do start to have some amount of recessionary activity, like when we expect, it's still not going to cause massive deflation. And so what's priced into the curve doesn't really make sense. Why won't a recession cause deflation or severe disinflation as it so often does? So it will, but the thing is to actually achieve the, achieve the Fed's objectives, you need to have a protracted period of it, right? So you can have deflation for a month, right? You can have deflation for two months, but for the Fed to durably get to, you know, its 2% target, it's just not going to be enough. Uh, so the, the Federal Reserve free and central banks often are, and I, it's judgmental phrase, so I feel, you know, I got to... But, but you know, behind the curve. I mean, they definitely were in 2021. They should have raised way before. And you, you look back to the ECB uh, raising interest rates in the summer of 2008 with the benefit of hindsight, which you know is makes it's an unfair comparison. Like the federal central banks have made a lot of mistakes, and often they keep on doing something when they really should change course. So just as they, the Federal Reserve, you know, kept uh, zero interest rate policy for way too long, they might keep interest rates at 5.5 percent interest rates at way too long. Uh, you know, as the economy goes into a recession, and that's what a lot of bond bulls and, uh, you know, recessionistas, that's what they say. And they say, oh, the Fed is wrong, the Fed is wrong. But uh, 
at, at what point, I mean, what really matters is what the how, what matters more, what the Federal Reserve should do or what the Federal Reserve does. Because if interest rates, if the Fed keeps interest rates at 5.5%, even as the economy, you know, even as economic bulls like admit like, oh, hey, yeah, we're in a recession now. Uh, I mean, you could, would you have a super inverted curve of just, you know, could, uh, ten, could 10 years rally to uh, 3% if, if even as the uh, Fed, you know, is stubborn and keeps interest rates at 5.5%? At, uh, right. I think that what, what, what you have to think about is the fact that it, the reason the Fed would be keeping interest rates that high, right, or high in that, in that environment is only if inflation doesn't hit, hit their target or look like it's going to hit their target, right? And so I think that in that environment, you're looking at way more of a stagflationary market pricing than you are like a deflationary market pricing. What, what we think you need, right, to actually get a, a bond bull, right, is you need to actually see an economy that is very clearly in recession and infl inflation that it's totally consistent with target. And there is no way that you can say that without cumulative evidence. And so, you know, speaking to, you know, this is a little bit out of our wheelhouse, but, you know, speaking to it a little bit because I think it's important. It, from, a, from a behavioral kind of aspect, the Fed kind of shot its shot in terms of the, we're going to forecast where inflation is at with the transitory thing, right? And so now, if, you, if you're on Powell's seat, Right? It's very unlikely that you're going to have this, oh, yeah, I can be forward looking and project where we're going to be in terms of inflation and if we're going to be at inflation target over the next couple of months. And so I think that, you know, being the Fed, as you said, being kind of behind the curve, they're going to they're going to hang on. And until it's very, very clear that we have, you know, very consistent disinflationary or deflationary pressures. Explain how you reconcile that view with that you think you know growth is kind of overhyped right now with the view that you think the you know inf inflation will still be kind of robust what happens over the next 12 months or the next 18 months right is an uncertainty at all times but what's priced into the bond market is a certainty right and that that is inconsistent with an uncertain economic path and so like you don't have to what what you know that is priced in is of a hundred percent certainty of four to five cuts. I mean, I'm gonna, you know, pr pr uh, be a nerd here and say it's, it's maybe it's pricing in a ninety percent chance of no cuts at all, but a ten percent chance of, of you know, fourteen cuts because there's a two thousand eight stuff. You know, it's 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 nonlinear. You could pricing in just the option value. Yeah. But what I'm what I, what I what I'm saying is that the 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 path there needs to be more uncertainty priced into the path. And so given where we are in the economy, right, we're, we're running currently on the, on, you know, we don't have a GDP now cost that, that, that runs every month and whatnot. We're running at close to an annualized rate of 12% real GDP, right? Nominal GDP, nominal GDP? Yeah, we, real, real GDP. Month, because we have a month on month now cost, which is different from Atlanta's Fed, and louder Fed's quarter over quarter now cost. So I'm, I'm citing month on month numbers, which are extremely strong. Okay. Okay. But, but no one thinks that, okay, this says, but that's like what they're taking one month's data and extrapolating it, you know? And, and, and so you can, if you, if you'd like, you can go back to say a, a one quarter trend and go and get a five or 6% number, right? Like that is still a part that's entirely inconsistent with nominal spending being under control. And so what's priced into the curve, right? Is way more consistent with a recession than it is with, uh, we're not sure, maybe we can have a recession beginning then. And that's what we think you need to fade. Got it. Right? It's not that you have to fade all five cuts. It's, it's that five is a lot. Five, five is a lot. Unless it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, like, like I said, we'll be happy to change our minds if things change, but so far, probably not. Uh, on the inflation side, you know, I've been talking to a lot of... Uh, investors, economists who are pretty confident on the recession train, and they're citing a, just that uh, inflation will continue to go down because there's so much disinflation or deflation in the uh, rental or owner-occupied rent, but mainly rental uh, co shelter component of the consumer price index. Uh, what do you think about that? And where, yeah, where do you think inflation is going to be? Right. So we, we have two different perspectives on inflation. So there's the, there's the bottom-up kind of item-by-item item perspective, and uh, there's the high level kind of macroeconomic dynamic, right? And so maybe, you know, since you're, since you're talking about the inflation items, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, 
I'm going to center this conversation on on CPI because it's timely, it's market moving, and we spend a good deal of time on CPI in particular. Um, so I think you're totally right that shelter is going to be down a bunch, right? Um, but I think at the same time, you also have to balance that by the fact that there are there are four major drivers of CPI inflation today and over time, right? So at least 85 and today about 95% of inflation variation is made up of essentially four categories, four, food, inflation, transport, and housing. So you're definitely right that the, the housing component is going to slow and will continue to slow. Uh, we've already seen evidence of that. So there was a time in the past where housing alone would have kept you above 2%. That time is behind us, right? Um, the, the, big, the big question mark that we have, and we have probably, um, we don't have a high degree of certainty of this because this is pretty tough to model, um, is that transport, is is likely to be one is likely to be more resilient than people are expecting. So, why is that? There are really two components, uh, two or three big components of of transport. Um, there's the transportation commodities and there's transportation services. And so, within transportation commodities, the the two types of commodities really that move the needle it's use cars and new cars. I think what um, most people are familiar with now is kind of using a very popular uh, wholesale index called Mannheim to estimate what's going to happen with CPI. And the reason that that's worked really well is because used car inflation has had one of the largest jumps in volatility in its history, right? And so as a result, your 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 um, your transportation commodities has almost been entirely dominated by what's happening with these used car prices. But over time, that volatility is likely to recede to a number more consistent with what we've seen historically, which is a just about equal contribution between new cars and used cars, right? And that is a, is a question that we have in our mind because what is happening in the economy is that you've had a very large shortage of automobile inventories, right? And those automobile inventories need to be rebuilt and they'll be primarily in, in, rebuilt in the form of new car purchases. And so when we net out those two impacts, it's very unlikely that we can continue on the same path of disinflation that we've been on coming from transport. Transport has been a huge contributor to the disinflation story right now. And so when we look at that impact, right, of new cars, used cars kind of normalizing and you have basically just a less negative picture we think that that is going to be kind of the fly in the ointment of the, you know, glide parts to two percent. So that's that's kind of the bottom bottom up perspective. So I'm just looking at the consumer price index for used cars and then for new cars. So for uh, new cars, it's it's still a positive rate of inflation, but the, the rate of inflation has gone down. And for used cars, you're seeing a rate of deflation, but prices are still well elevated against a historical level. Uh, why do you think prices will just kind of flatline and not go down, especially given you're seeing a pickup in auto delinquencies, which you know might be a leading indicator for uh, deflation or a, a slowing down of ink rate increases because it will you know increase the supply if there's repossessions. Right. Awesome. Awesome question. I love it. Um, so I think uh, this is this is kind of like where kind of the nitty gritty granularity of our, of our stuff really is helpful, right? So there are there are essentially two different types of order demand, right? There's 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 end user demand, and what you're citing, right, about order delinquencies and things like that is absolutely true. So if we have the cycle template play out, where you know uh, financial conditions are tight, it's tough to get an order loan, your income is slowing, you're going to have weak end user demand. But at the same time, right, we're another source of demand for automobiles, particularly new automobiles, right, is automobile dealer and wholesaler. Um, demand, right? So you have manufacturers; they make they make automobiles, and then the dealers have to purchase them from them, and then they resell them to uh, end consumer. And so, what has happened to retailers in particular and wholesalers to a certain degree is that because of supply chain issues that happened during COVID, they have um, the the lowest level of inventories relative to sales ever. So, you know, re, uh, automobile inventories. So when we're talking about automobiles, we're talking about just, you know, cars and things like that, not heavy trucks. Um, and so those inventories, so typically you maintain an inventory to sale ratio of about two, 
post-pandemic, we're looking at a number that's about 0.4. And so it's very hard for dealers to kind of manage you know, their, their sales right now. And so you can have a normalization process right, of this inventory to sales in two ways, either sales tank, but they would have to tank absolutely precipitously. right? And based off current dynamics, it doesn't look like that's happening or it's going to happen very you know, in the future. And so maybe sales come down, but at the same time, you can also have inventory build. And so we think that the restocking of automobile inventories over time is actually a net support to new cars. And I think that the the whole this whole discussion, right, is much more about it's just unlikely that we're going to continue deflation in the transportation sector at the rate at which we're going. Much less about, oh, we're going to see a resurgence in transportation inflation to new mm-hmm. heights. That's right. Right. And I think that that's one of the things that is really not kind of well, you know, this would be obviously hard to figure out, but I don't think it's one of those things that's well appreciated and well priced. And so when you're thinking about kind of the plus and minus of inflation, we think that, hey, even if you hold automobile demand or automobile inflation, apologies, flat, you actually won't get to 2%. So where, where's the inflation going to come from? So if you have sustained food and energy inflation, roughly positive, even if you account for the disinflation that you've seen in housing, plus some stuff that's likely to happen with medical insurance, the combination of those things will keep you in a higher inflation environment. And that's kind of the, the bottom up item by item specific. All right, I let, what, we, what is your prediction for core inflation? So X uh, energy, because you know, price of oil, you know, could be 300, could be 10, like who, who knows? Um, and it's such a volatile component that the Federal Reserve says they pay more attention to core inflation, but obviously headline, you know, is very important because it's so volatile. But yeah, so not including house, food and energy, which, you know, anything can happen. Where is the source of inflation going to be? Right. And and so when we when we talk about core, right? So I think there's a there's a distinction between so the 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 analysis we discussed is about CPI, right? And CPI tends to be more good sensitive and weighted more towards good. What the Fed cares about is core PCE, and that tends to have a little bit more bias towards services because it's a broader construct and more consistent with what's in the broader economy. And so that component has a lot more services in there, and which is contingent upon employment, which brings us to kind of like the macroeconomic dynamic of it all, right? And which, again, brings us back to this, one of the most important drivers of whether we get inflation to tamp down is whether we can control credit and whether we can control investment. The reason that you need to control credit and you need to control investment is because you need to hurt profits enough to have layoffs. Those layoffs are what's going to cause you to eventually have reduced wages, right? And so when we look at the macroeconomic dynamic of what's happening with net interest expense relative to what's happening in, uh, in nominal incomes, we're just not going to be at that point very soon. We'll get there. But, you know, and this kind of speaks to the more typical, like, jargony, inflation is the last thing to fall, right? So even if, you're, even if your base case is, okay, we get a recession in Q1, Q2, whichever one, take your pick, inflation is not going to fall until after that. And it is a really lagging metric. And yeah, personal consumption expenditure, that price index has more services than CPI has more goods, as you said, and services has been, you know, resilient and hot, whereas goods, has that's been a, a big slowdown. So you mentioned... Commercial credit, the Fed has to restrict credit. The Fed doesn't control you know, what we think of as credit. Bank deposit, that's controlled by banks. And so if you looked at the actual amount of loans in 2021 and 2022, we had a huge monetary inflation of credit credit boom, banks just lending left and right. Some of that's mortgages, but also auto, credit card. Uh, so I'm just looking at loans and leases and bank credit for all commercial banks from Fred. Interestingly, that's at $12 trillion. That's been pretty flat since late February, early March, and you know, in early March, Silicon Valley Bank failed. So I mean, if you continued to have this flatlining in credit, I would be surprised. I mean, conventional wisdom would say that in if, if there's a flat line, you know, we're still at 12 trillion in credit in a year, that the economy is not doing hot. Um, and then you look at, you know, uh, so that's mortgages, but then there's a you know, com- um, consumer uh, commercial and industrial loans, that's down. Credit card delinquencies are up. Uh, uh, auto loan delinquencies are up. So yeah, I guess if if the consumer is so strong, and I, look, I don't really necessarily disagree with you. I'm just, you know, for the for the sake of argument, is kind of assuming the opposite case. But if the consumer is so strong and we have 3.5% unemployment rate, why are credit card delinquencies going up? Uh, why are auto delinquencies going up? 
And why are banks not extending credit? Um, I, I mean, they've been flat over the past seven, seven or eight months. Those don't. Those just, uh, seem to me to be uh, not sufficient conditions for a recession, but perhaps necessary ones. So I think that the the main thing is right. So those are those are two different channels. So the the, the consumer credit card delinquencies, right? True, but relative to the amount of actual income. So if you do an attribution, so we we run attribution analysis in terms of what how much how much lending and borrowing is actually going into a particular item of spending. Um, credit card credit card debt relative to actually in the level of income and spending you have in the economy is like a very tiny portion of actual spending. Correct, and it's it's like lower than it was in two thousand one, right? Right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. I'm sure there's more credit card delinquencies, but is it going to bring us to a recession? Probably like, no. Um, and so, you know, that that's that component of that, right? I mean, it depends if banks keep on extending credit and they just, you know, increase, I guess, the the, the uh, APRs to account for the loan losses, maybe not. But if, if banks cut back on c- um, credit cards, it will. Interestingly, though, history shows that banks actually do not stop lending until like the recession is almost over. So I know the visual you're referring to. I think the important thing to think about that is that it's not the level or the growth of of credit card credit card debt outstanding that matters. Neither of those things matter. It's the flow of those things. The flow of those things is what's present in spending. And that flow is a tiny number. Most income, right? Income and spending, personal income, personal consumption expenditures, especially services driven expenditures is finance just by income. So you you get your job, you get your paycheck, and yeah, you might use a your credit card for X, Y, and Z, but most of it is financed by your income and employment. And so that's the picture with the consumer. Like, yeah, you can have a tightening on the margins, but that level by itself is not enough, right? Then when you go to, I think a very valid point that you're making is the commercial and industrial loans and the real estate loans. I think that that's very valid. So the, if you look at that flow, that flow is a very dramatic part of investment spending in the economy. But I think what you have to reconcile is that the, the weighted impact of those things is still smaller than the amount of income we have in the economy right now. So there's income and there's credit being spent in the economy at all times, right? You need to, the Fed really has a control kind of indirectly on how much credit we're going to have spent into the economy. And what we have to do is we have to damage this credit a lot to cause top line to fall, which causes profits to fall, which fall enough to actually elicit layoffs. And so what what you're saying is you're highlighting the right thing in that, okay, commercial industrial loans and real estate loans, auto loans are starting to come down. You need a lot more of that, which is why we've been making the case that, okay, we're in a good position between tightening and liquidity conditions. We're in a good place if you can call it a good place, if you want a contraction in activity, but you're in the right spot. You just have to sustain these conditions for a long while. Yes. And it sounds like you think the Federal Reserve will sustain those conditions for a long while. And I'm, I'm probably, you know, I don't put too much faith in my opinion, but I, yeah, I probably would, would agree with you. So tactically, your short assets, stocks mm-hmm. and bonds, probably you slightly prefer the short on, on the bonds. What is your long term or let's say one year, three year, multi year outlook on assets. If we do enter a recession, as you say in uh, you know Q one, Q two of next year. Um, so you know we never put on one year views. Like that's just not what we do. But um, to answer the second part of your question, uh, if we have a recession and it's a serious recession, we think that yeah, it's going to be long bonds versus stocks. I think that that's going to be a no brainer trade. Where you'll be able to see, you know, claims start roofing. You'll be able to see, you know, um, layoffs in mass. You'll be able to see activity tanking. And if inflation is, you know, uh, complies with Fed target, I think that that's going to be a completely no-brainer, straightforward trade. But I think the the thing is that you have to be monitoring how you get there, right? That can be a long time. Like it can be six months. It can be eight months. It could be ten months. It could be it could be three months, right? And so what you have to track is, okay, how are these cyclical components? And how are asset values reacting to existing tightening, right? And that is your guidepost to what's going to happen with employment and what's going to happen with inflation eventually. And so until you get enough tightening, which causes enough pain, you just can't put that trade on 
right? It, it's it's not it's going to be a very difficult environment, and that's what we've had this year. Basically, you've had okay, like we're going to get to a recession eventually. Let's price all of these cuts into the curve, and at every turn, data's been a little bit more resilient. Sometimes it's not even that the data is good; it's just good relative to expectations. And that's been a theme this year, right? It's not about data being good outright. It's about being good relative to expectations. And then you have some amount of cuts priced out of the curve, and then you do it again, and it do it, you do it again. And so I think that that's really what you have to think about, that eventually the trade will be to go max long bonds. But there's, there can be a long time between now and then. And what's your level of confidence that we do have a recession in Q2 of next year, or let's see next year at all, and if we do, what's your view that it'll be a mild one versus a more severe one? I think that we have a good deal of confidence that we'll have one around Q2 next year um, based on the, the the pressures that we've laid out. As long as we stay on the on the path, we think we'll eventually get there. Um, but in, and in terms of severity, I think uh, we'll have to chat again when we're closer. With, with, with regards to growth expectations kind of topping out, right? what we think is that, remember, what's priced into equity markets is is the change in growth expectations. So growth expectations getting good or growth expectations getting bad. And what we found in our work, right, is that that change in expectations is actually very, very consistent with the ongoing clip of nominal GDP. And so, you know, if you want to get a small edge, what you have to basically figure out is, okay, is where is nominal GDP going to head? Is it going to get head up or down? And you can get a small edge kind of in terms of understanding where growth expectations are going to go. Now there's a different there's a different aspect that nominal GDP corresponds to revenues. It doesn't necessarily co- correspond to earnings or EPS, right? And that's a little bit of a jump. But let's if we stay with the kind of nominal GDP thing, as we've kind of outlined, right? We think that the real growth part is path is lower from here because we think that the cyclical conditions are aligned to get low, lower real growth and stable inflation, right? Stable kind of resilient sticky inflation. The, you add those two things up, you're talking about a nominal environment that's slowing, and you're also talking about economic economic like economic market conditions that recently have priced a very, very strong increase in growth relative to expectations. And so when we think about where growth is at, like it's probably just going to decelerate, right? When we look at nominal revenue, it's high, it's highly likely to decelerate from our perspective. And so we think that you're going to have a certain amount of repricing as that occurs. In addition to that, when and so this matters when you're thinking about stocks, right? We think that you're going to have that repricing of growth expectations, but you're also going to have the discount rate effect and the issuance effect, right? Which is going to be this liquidity impact. You put those things together and we don't think stocks look that great. I think that when we actually think about you know, assets in general right now, I think the thing that, you know, we really have to think about is that we're in a very different dynamic to the one that we've been in for the last 20, 30 years, right? Where you've had, you know, a 60, 40 portfolio do really, really well for a long period of time. And um, we think that being able to, you know, prefer cash over assets, or if you're an active investor, being able to short assets, right, is going to be really, really valuable in this kind of environment. And it has been, right? That makes sense to me because for three quarters in a row, actual earnings for the S&P 500 have been down on a year-over-year basis. But during that exact same time period, there's been a rally in the S&P, a really rigor- vigorous one. Why? Because I imagine, I mean, I know, but, but like forward earnings have been priced higher. So they're thinking, oh, Q4 2023 and then 2024, 20, it's going to be a gangbuster year because the economy is going to be so great because uh, you know of, of GDP growth. So you just think that, even if the economy does okay, it will underperform those expectations. Yeah, exactly. So we think that we're going to have a repricing of those expectations. And then I think that also when you think about the equity rally, right? A large part of the equity rally, so if you if you wind back, when the, when the treasury was not issuing duration, nothing needed to be sold to meet that duration. But now we have this duration coming online, which means that you're going to have to absorb that duration. And one of the sources of absorbing that duration is going to be a pulling of risk, right? So somebody is going to sell their sell their credit to buy um, to buy to buy a treasury. Someone else is going to start, sell their stocks to buy their credit. And so what we're going to have is essentially, you know, the the portfolio rebalance effect in reverse. And so I think that that was also one of the major things when you're thinking about this equity rally. We do these macroeconomic decompositions of, of the of the the drivers of asset markets, right? 
And I think that the way we always think about it is that liquidity conditions potentiate whether assets are going to fall or rise, right? So a balanced asset portfolio is going to do well when liquidity conditions are good. But what determines the, the, the intra-asset returns, right? So is it stocks versus bonds? Is it commodities versus stocks? Is growth and inflation conditions? And so what do we have? We had liquidity, right? Because of what happened with SVB, what happened with treasury issuance, and all of those things actually improve, right? On the margin, which means that basically the, the Fed and treasury were actually pulling liquidity out of the system in 2022. That stopped happening. Nominal GDP was really strong, and we haven't actually talked about the private sector liquidity kind of stuff, but um, nominal GDP was really strong, and that actually flows into private sector liquidity. What do you mean private sector liquidity? We haven't talked about that. I thought we did. Um, so I think that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, so, you know, people often talk about, you know, reserves and treasuries and stuff like that. Like, that's one aspect of liquidity, mm -hmm. right? And so remember how we were talking about liquidity is really basically about how much risk there is and how much risk there is being issued into markets, right? The Treasury and the Fed aren't the only people that operate there, right? The, 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 there are corporates, there are financial institutions, there are households. All of these players are part of the liquidity ecosystem. And so I think that what you have to think about, right, is that the private, the private sector, like liquidity creation, you know, you can think of it as, oh, like we're borrowing a ton of money. Do we borrow it, you know, at a long duration or short duration? There are financial intermediaries who, you know, do things like repo, right? So when financial conditions are really good, we engage in a lot of repo, usually backed by either, you know, MBS or treasuries and things like that. And so you have a very large component of liquidity, which is also private sector liquidity. And that would be counted in M2? No, it would no. not. Um, because M2, M2 largely contains only deposits, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at things like money market funds, you're looking at things like commercial paper, you're looking at uh, things like, um, um, you know, kind of the shadow banking kind of system and things like that. And so what happens there, though, a really, really large part of that liquidity actually just flows from nominal GDP. So the way to think about it is, OK, you have a, a massive, massive increase in nominal GDP, right, coming from inflationary pressures in 2022. Where does that money go? That, that money actually flows into asset markets, right? And depending on who owns the money, so for example, if a corporation owns a bonanza in corporate profits, what do they do with that corporate profits? They put it into buy commercial paper. Stock. They buy back their stock. They put it into commercial paper. It goes into money market funds. It goes into tre treasury bills. It goes into all of these things. And all of those effects, right? right? And so you can think about the, the, the people issuing those things their issuance is really easily absorbed. And so there's a very big component of liquidity that is pro-cyclical private sector liquidity. And so what happened from our perspective in the liquidity ecosystem is that the, the policy impulse from liquidity flatlined, but the private sector impulse was strong through the entire year. And so the, the policy impulse is such a big force in markets today that what it does basically just overshadows anything the private sector is doing nowadays. And that's why, you know, you get to only focus on RRP and you know, bills or whatever. But if you wind back, and so this is some of one of the things that we do, we build liquidity strategies. And we try to have our liquidity strategies not just work in the 2000s, we, have, we try to have them work in the 60s. And so when you actually go back and wind back in time, the, the Fed and Treasury were not, they were not the dominant players in the liquidity ecosystem until the 2000s. And so you have to have this understanding of what's happening in the private sector as well. And so when we looked at that, what we saw is that, okay, the Fed and Treasury kind of flatlined in terms of their liquidity contribution. But what happened with the private sector is just massive amounts of issuance and activity. Oh, so you're, talk you're talking about like um, investment bond deals being done, equity issuance, that type of stuff. Yeah, okay. That type of stuff. Because it's all part of the, it's the same liquidity picture. And so when you actually look at that, right, that really skyrocketed last year. And part of it is because you just didn't have to go and underwrite treasury issuance. And so when you put that entire picture together, the private sector basically had a ton of money. Repo went to the moon. Um, you were able to you know, underwrite a lot of the risk, lever up. You didn't have to finance the treasury, so you didn't have to sell any of your assets. And that, for us, is the driving factor in terms of why equities did as well as they did. The, 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 so the direction was set by, okay, growth better than expectations. 
and inflation inflation pricing coming down, so break evens falling, but the amount it did well was set by this liquidity impact. Okay, and it, fair to say, so if the, if the money supply last in terms of M two just bank deposits went down, it actually like if you put it on a chart, it looks very ominous, but it actually was just replaced by very similar cash like assets. Right. Treasury goals. And now it's going to be replaced by treasury coupons. But treasury coupons, I mean, they're how I mean they're still safe. There's you know very, no credit risk, uh very little credit risk. And um, I mean yields are so high that if you still have a four percent drawdown on a, a treasury bill, you're like you're paid that in a coupon, you know? I mean, like I all these assets that I feel like just in the in the rate world, it's funny, no one really cared about floating rate products when interest rates were at zero. <laughs> but and they would have been protected if they had floating rate products with the interest rate rise of 5%. But now that interest rates are at 5%, everyone's talking about how to protect your portfolio from rising <laughs> rates. It's like, I don't think interest rates are going to 10%. You know, it's too late. You already, you already lost. Like, maybe right. by some duration, you know? Right. Um, so I think that, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about, like, the, the point you're making about, hey, like, you know, even coupons are, they're still safe assets. Yeah, like, I totally, that, that's a very valid point. But the question is safe relative to what, Right. And so this is a big part of the liquidity thing that I think is very underappreciated. I think it's very clear to anybody that cash is liquidity or anything that looks like cash is liquidity. But there's a big component of liquidity that's actually time varying. So if you, if you, if you wind back to previous periods of quantitative tightening, curves actually inverted, right? You actually had bids for long bonds during those periods. Unlike today, where you know you're actually going to have a steepening as QT kind of resumes its impact in markets, and what is the difference? The difference is economic conditions and what markets are pricing. So yeah, like Treasuries are very good assets, right? But in today's economic environment, relative to bills, they're not such good assets, right? And so there's a time varying aspect to how risk is absorbed, and so I think that's like one of the aspects that's just underappreciated. Okay, so I don't know if I fully understood that point of the uh, time aspect of liquidity, so you're going to have to explain that. But also, I'll just say that, yes. So quantitative tightening, the Federal Reserve letting roll off or you know, effectively selling, but not actually selling, reducing its holdings of securities that should uh, increase the supply of the securities to the market net-net, so the price should be lower, so yields should be higher for long-term assets. But actually, as you said, yeah, you have an inverted yield curve. Yields go down uh, during the last period of quantitative tightening of, of you know, 2017, 2018, um, but I'll and you're saying, oh, this time around it's different. But I will say the yield curve, you know, inverted in April of last year, uh, and then QT began what July of 2022. You t you tell me. I mean, it, it ratcheted it up, but the yield curve steadily got even more inverted um, through through then. Yeah, but 90% of that inversion is well, actually probably 95% of that inversion is is just short rates, right? And so, like, there's a difference between a bull steepener and a bear steepener, right? And so, you know, you you had a, uh, sorry, a, a bull flattener and a bear fat, flattener. And so, um, what you've had this year is like most of the the inversion is just caused by short rates going up, right? And that's very different from the dynamic that we're discussing, where you kind of have like you know QT going on without interest rate hikes happening, right? And you actually have bonds bid. So, which speaks. So, this is the time varying aspect of it, right? Like, which is just a complicated way of saying that. That changes over time. The, the, uh -huh. reason, the, the reason that it changes over time is because in a certain economic environment, assets are, certain types of assets are more or less risky, right? And in today's environment, if you, know, you look at elevated nominal growth, potential for inflationary pressures and things like that, bonds are just not insulated from those pressures, right? But when you wind back to previous periods of QT, we actually had just a disinflationary, possibly even deflationary environment. So it's just way easier to absorb that issuance. And so a big part of what happens with liquidity is actually just driven by what's happening with growth and inflation, which is just a different way of saying, hey, like, are people going to easily absorb these assets that are coming online? How risky is it changes over time, right? But what we do know for sure is that cash or cash-like assets are not typically risky. And so whenever you start deviating from cash and cash like assets, right, you start introducing more risk into the system. How that risk is absorbed depends on economic conditions. Uh, anyway, well, Ahan, tell us about Prometheus Macro. Obviously, your Twitter account is uh, Prometheus Macro, but 
Uh, why do you start the company? What kind of uh, research do you provide to clients? And also, why the name Prometheus? Those are good questions, man. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we. So Prometheus is a systematic macro research firm, right? And we're really dedicated to the democratization of finance. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to level the playing field and give day-to-day, -day, everyday investors access to some of the highest level elite institutional tools and resources that you can have. So we provide research ranging from you know daily trading signals to 50 page in-depth research reports on everything that's happening in the US economy that you could imagine, right? And you know what we're really trying to do is create a very, very granular moving picture of what's happening with the economy. And what we add to that is that we try to take our understanding and systematize that understanding to create rules-based systematic portfolios to help investors kind of navigate through market cycles. And, so, and that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. It's also named Prometheus, right? Um, Prometheus, uh, as you can imagine, was 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 inspired by uh, the Greek Titan who stole fire from the gods and gave it to man. And um, the way we think of what we're doing is we're taking the best institutional quality macro tools and giving them to day-to-day -day investors. Got it. And last question, do you do any sector analysis like, oh, I prefer this sector over that sector or no? We do some of it. Um, I, I won't claim to have a subject area expertise, but you know we're, we're quantitative investors. So we we do um, we we do positions across commodities, you know. So I think we cover universe about fifty different ETFs, which span the commodity, fixed income, and uh, equity universe, right? So we do sectors and things like that. And um, most of the 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 alpha that you know we prospectively have it over there comes from our quant signaling process. I I wouldn't have any very specific color to give you on any particular. It's sector. just like the computer told me to do it. That you know, the computer told me to do it. Um, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> there we go. Well, Han, thanks so much for, for joining us. It's great to meet you. And thanks everyone for watching. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Jack. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and Blockworks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.